This is Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. You're good. What's going on, folks? Hope you had a great weekend. Welcome to the second week of Winnipeg Sports Talk and Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. I'm Andrew Patterson, host for the festivities over the next hour plus here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, coming to you live on our YouTube channel and, of course, on the podcast feed a little bit later on this afternoon. Uh, great to have you all with us. we got a big show today, and coming out of a weekend like we just had, um, we got a big weekend roundup, which will probably take the majority of the next half hour and then at the bottom of the hour, our old pal from NHL.com, Dave McCarthy, will join us. Now, Dave covers the entire league. He hosts the Sunday Brunch on Sirius XM NHL Radio, covers the Leafs in the league for NHL.com. I mean, Dave's a great guy to talk to. Always love having him on the program in the past. But we figured what a great day to talk to Dave coming off the Jets' big win on Saturday night. Get his thoughts, takeaways from the Jets' Leaf series And then get ready for another big week in the North Division starting right here in Winnipeg tonight as it is a game day and the Jets are hosting the Montreal Canadiens tonight at Bell MTS Place. Two games against the Habs, two games against the Edmonton Oilers this week. So a very busy schedule as the Jets are within striking distance of first place in the division. Um, So we'll do that a little later on. Some funny stuff coming out of the weekend involving potato chips, Jose Canseco's insane tweets, A-Rod and J-Lo, which actually touches on Jose Canseco as well. So we'll save some nonsense for the end of the program. We'll get to some great North Division talk coming up at the bottom of the hour with Dave McCarthy. But we've got to talk about the uh, the Jets, the Briar, the players, the big weekends for the Moose and the Winnipeg Ice. And to do that, we get going and welcome in Michael Remus. Remo, what's up? How are you? Us uh, happy to be here. Thank you, uh, thank you for welcoming me in. Uh, great weekend. Uh, ready for another great week. Big Jets win on Saturday. Uh, you know, had a nice little bonfire Friday night. Saturday got out to the park. It's warming up, feeling good. Uh, so yeah, we're in a great mood here on this Monday. Oh my God, it is gorgeous outside right now. And you know, I said throughout this horrible year that. The one, the one people, the one person that had really been sort of has, has our backs here in Winnipeg through the pandemic has been Mother Nature. I know we had that bad snap of about 10 or 11 days where it was minus 20. But other than that, it has been glorious. Um, I think like everyone got out on the weekend and got outside a little bit. And um, oh, my God, spring is just about here. Mm. And, um, you know, people's spirits were already high from what the Jets were doing. And we got some nice weather. And it seems like, uh, you know, spirits are bright up a little bit around here hey before we get into the program obviously you have to thank our sponsors royal sports boston pizza winnipeg the nick and nikki dq group and not auto corp and remo first things first we got to thank trevor not not auto corp because today winnipeg sports talk has a banner ad with not on the front page of the winnipeg free press we've been getting some great great feedback on that and Honestly, as we try and start out this new journey and let people know about what we're doing and how they find us, pretty amazing to have sponsors and the support that we do from the people that have been on with us from day one, um, as exemplified by uh, that great ad today that not threw out today, promoting Winnipeg Sports Talk. Yes, there it is right there on the screen. Everyone can see it. Never thought that my name uh, would be on the front page of the free press but there it is uh, pretty cool your picture as well the logo and i can't tell you how many compliments we've gotten uh, on that logo looks great uh with the blue on that ad so thank you very much uh, the guys at not for putting that thing together yeah that was uh, that was amazing and uh, you know i hopefully there'll be some people that maybe are not normal um podcast listeners or can you know find out a little bit more i've already had a couple tweets from it shout out to gordy tomlinson gordy if you managed to find it and watching great to have you with us and I'm just looking, of course, if you're if you're with us live on YouTube right now, throw us a like, get some comments going. And I, I have to say a quick hello to a legendary old warm-up in 1290 listener, our friend Aaron Forshu, who uh, says, Hey, Haas Remo, it's the IC Cham Tulsa, Oklahoma. The show has been great so far. 
Aaron um, famously used to drive around. I believe he's in the legal profession. He's he's from Manitoba. He's now in Oklahoma, and he seemed to be at a different Major League Baseball game every day. Um, would send us pictures from it. Would listen to the program when he was driving from place to place. So um, and he showed up at a Bomber game with an actual Intercontinental Championship <laughs> title belt. So he's uh, he's known as the IC champ from there. But uh, whether it's people here in Winnipeg or those uh, w- with Winnipeg connections watching from around the world, it's uh, amazing to be able to have everyone pop into the chat and give some feedback, some hot takes with us as we get into the program. Yeah, we've got some uh, incredible messages, just uh, DMs on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, someone just messaged me on LinkedIn today. Hey, I'm from Calgary. Thank you guys so much for putting this on. You know, keeps me connected to the city, and I think people... Uh, you know, people in Winnipeg love to hear about the local teams, but I think people who no longer live in Winnipeg and who do like to listen to uh, our programming, uh, does you know, they feel closer to the city they grew up in, and also, again, closer uh, to their, their favorite teams as well. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, yeah, kicking into week two, a great way to start it off with our friends at Not Auto Corp with that ad in the free press. Thanks again to Trevor on that, and um, a big, big win. Hey, just before we get to the Jets on the weekend, how um, it, Daylight Savings is here. I'm a big Daylight Savings guy, mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily going back the other way. Um, but how, how's the body clock this morning, Reem, after? Uh, I mean, I guess your body clock screwed already because you have a young child. You don't really yeah. have much say in the matter. <laughs> yeah, we just made sure we woke him up, or my wife did. Shout out to her for waking up uh, at 8 a.m., making sure that he he was up and didn't sleep in. Uh, so I mean it's totally fine. I didn't. I felt no effects of anything. I had to change the clock in my car today, or ch- you know, ch- change the clock on my stove. They're not automatic, so uh, microwave clock you got to change all of them. You got to change them. But uh, I don't know. I didn't, I haven't noticed anything. Maybe I will. I will Battery, go- you're also you're a family man and a homeowner too. You need to be changing uh, your smoke detector batteries. That's a tip from caller number one, Gregory Liverpool. Is that a tip? to make sure we do that and did that. Yeah, okay. exactly. I I probably should do that. Yeah, I definitely oh. definitely need to do that. <laughs> Holy smokes! Got to give a shout out to Wayne Jones. He's tuning in from Norway. No, we're getting big in Scandinavia right now, Reem. This is awesome. I'm... I'll tell you what. It doesn't matter whether if you're from Norway or whether you are from downtown Winnipeg, Manitoba. If you're a Jets fan, you were pretty fired up as to the way the series against the Toronto Maple Leafs ended. You know, Michael, we talked a lot about the Jets getting three points of a possible four in the first two games, but really doing it on the back of Connor Hellebuck. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant, and you know, you can call it stealing points, stealing games if you want. I mean, the Leafs were... Outside of goaltending, a more dangerous team. They had far more high danger scoring chances, but the Jets were able to, you know, get that late goal in the second game, mine a point out of it, won the first one. And I think, you know, going into talking about it on Friday's show, we kind of thought that this should be the best game of the series, a real rubber match. The Jets had something to prove. And, um, you know, the Leafs still wanted to, you know, get some points. They only won one of their last four. Um, I was optimistic going into Saturday night's game, but I don't think uh, anyone could have imagined such a wonderful 60-minute performance by the Winnipeg Jets, who did not lean on their goaltender. They outchanced in the high danger category Toronto 14 to three, which was an absolute 180 from what we'd seen in the first few games. And um, the Jets get five of a possible six points in Toronto and go into a busy week in the North Division, starting with the Habs tonight in striking distance of Toronto. You're not kidding when you say complete 180, Huss. Uh, you know, going into that game Saturday, I thought we were in for a letdown game. You know, they had played two games in a row against Toronto. They got a shot. They got a chance. Connor Hellbuck, you know, carried them to a win and to an overtime loss. And you thought, okay, I mean, what's going to change here? You know, they got Brossois starting a net. I'm kind of worried. Why wouldn't you start Hellbuck? Well, I don't know if because they started Brossois, the team felt they needed to uh, play better defensively. I know the players were saying that they you know, had a real commitment there. They didn't leave the zone early. But again, I mean, high danger chances, 14-3 for the Jets. The Jets on the right side of the uh, five. That's Sorry, that's a 5-on-5. Five five. The 5-on-5 five five, uh, shot attempts as well uh, were in favor of the Jets. Uh, it was incredible to watch and you know, almost got off to a really rough start with that Goal, it was disallowed. There was clearly a hand pass. Uh, I shout out to video review for that one catching that. 
Uh, you, sometimes you never know with video review, even though it was pretty clear. Like, it took a while. Well, it, it took forever. It took a while. Like, I mean, it, took, it, it was a two-minute break, and, I mean, everyone, you're watching the broadcast, and the guys are, think, saying what everyone's thinking. Why the hell is this taking so long? This should be a very short, short review. Um but you know it went it went the right way. It was a correct call, and they ended up getting back. And I think if anything, that might have been a good thing for the Winnipeg Jets, um, because Loren Brossois didn't look great on that on that goal. Um, but you know you have a couple minutes to you know decompress a little bit, get back out there, and they certainly were better after that. You know it was funny. I had a few tweets after the game, you know, talking about Brossois and Remo. You know, I've said this many times in Winnipeg, Manitoba. The two most popular athletes at any given time are the Jets' backup goalie and the Bombers' backup quarterback. And that's just, you know, part of the pressure that goes with being the top dog and the guy that, you know, has the main responsibility. There's always someone nipping at your heels. Now, in this situation, Connor Hellebuck is, you know, he's clearly not just the Jets' starting goaltender um, and a guy that has earned that position and the security that comes with it but arguably night in and night out the most important person on this team. That this year, it's so important to get strong performances from your backup goaltender. And for the most part this season, that's been the case. Um, I'll say this. Brassois, the first half of the game, I thought was somewhat shaky. First goal, I mean, will happen. The second goal, you need to stop. And, you know, I think a lot of people watching that game, going from a one nothing lead to very quickly down to one thought, oh, man, this is... Uh, you know, Hellebuck was playing so great. Why wasn't Hellebuck in? Well, I'll tell you what, Loren Brassois, um, and probably maybe more the credit really goes to the team for, you know, giving him a relatively easy night, especially the second half, as far as, you know, not a lot of high danger scoring chances, not a lot of action around him. But I think there was the potential for that game to maybe get away from the Jets and the goaltender after the second one went in. But that was the last one that did. And um, you know, credit to the defensive performance for the Jets. We haven't seen a lot of those this year. But that was um, about as good as it gets for Winnipeg. And Brassois, after you know, not looking like he had his A game for the first half hour, got the job done when he needed it the most. And uh, that was in the third period of what was a tight game until the Jets sort of blew it open. Yeah, Brassois wasn't uh, spectacular, but he was solid. He's been spectacular earlier this season. But every time he starts, uh, the game's over. I'm like, this guy needs to start more. He's been very good spelling Connor Hellebuck. You want Hellebuck to be fresh uh, for the playoffs. So, uh, Bro- I mean, Brossois, good, very good. Happy to say that he had a, you know, was great two years ago. Last year, a bit of a, a down year, but he's really bounced back this year, and he's been great. And talk about third period. I mean, the Jets really, really uh, took over that third period. Uh, they were they were excellent. And talk about guys getting off a, a slump. Adam Lowry uh, scoring his first one in a while, assisted by uh, Appleton, and I mean Appleton's been so was so good in this uh, in this series and so good all year. Nikolai Ehlers on the power play, uh, what a shot that was! <laughs> and and then just when I was like, oh okay, uh, let's get some more power play too. These guys are scoring. Uh, power play one on the five on three. Mark Scheifele. Uh you haven't seen uh, enough of that from him this year. I know he's up there with points, but. Uh, that shot on the on the power play, I almost want to see it a bit more. That was a real real nice goal. So uh, that top line was very good, uh, very good. And we did have one lineup change. Uh, it was Logan Stanley going in for Nate Beaulieu, who's placed on IR, and they'll go with the same lineup tonight. But uh, that was a great game uh, by the Jets on Saturday. I came away really impressed. I mean, I was you know I was I wasn't tearing them down all week, but I was skeptical all week. I'm like, how are they going to keep winning? If they keep getting outshot, well, somehow they finally figure out a way to, uh, you know, put the pressure on their opponent, and you hope they can figure out a way to do that going forward. And they played Montreal very tight, uh, you know, even maybe getting outplayed and getting, you know, getting saved by Hellbuck and a couple of those, but they're all going to overtime, except for that one we've forgotten about that happened last Saturday. But I'm expecting another tight game today, and maybe we'll see the same Jets team from Saturday that is able to... Uh, be on the uh, on the upper hand in terms of shot attempts and high danger chances yeah well certainly i think most of our uh, listeners and viewers will hope that is in fact the case uh, daniel says i think the jets played well on saturday i just don't think the leafs brought their a game could feel it in the first period even the two goals they scored were transition plays i'll, I'll agree with you yeah the leafs were not as good as they were in the first couple games and you know part of that probably will be the way they performed and part of it probably the way the jets stepped up 
Um, as I said, you know, at the end of this series, these teams are playing each other in 10 times this season. You know, you'll look back to particular games where one team didn't step up the way they needed. One time a goalie stole it. One time there was a big, uh, you know, a late goal that turned a tie game into a regulation win. I mean, it's all part of a bigger picture. Um, and the bottom line is it's about getting points. I always say pro sports, results-based business. What were the results? If you're winning, well, you're probably pretty happy about it. Now, you know, the Jets, I think at midway point of the season, know that there's a number of areas that they need to improve and need to continue to get better in. And mainly in our own end is really the start of it. I think everyone knows that Connor Hellebuck will be reliable in net and Brassois when he's in. The team can certainly score goals. Um, it's a matter of, you know, making it a little more easier on your uh, goaltender. And they certainly did that on Saturday night. Um, but there's a, a lot, lot of runway left in this North division right now. But the bottom line is reading the jets, you know, with their performance last week and their play as of late, you know, go into this game tonight with the Montreal Canadians. They've got two games over the next couple days. The Leafs don't even play the jets four back with three in hand. Um, you get off to a good start this week and win a couple games. I mean, we could be talking about a team that's in first place by the time that we get the Thursday night and the jets take on the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. No matter which way you put it, Huss, the Jets took five of six possible points from a Toronto team who's first in the division. And as you said, uh, the Jets, they're three games, you know, have three less games played than Toronto. Uh, a couple points back. What is that? Four points back, if I can read correctly off my phone. And I mean, that's huge. And then you got a couple of games, you know, big games this week Montreal, two, Edmonton, a couple. So we'll see how it goes. The Jets can put themselves in prime position. We had said before the year Toronto, heavy favorites. In among the sports books, heavy, heavy favorites. Uh, we thought, you know, I think this Jets seems pretty good. I think they're, um, you know, they're a bit undervalued here. And here you're seeing that they are, in fact, very close, very tight. And they got, you know, playing a bunch more times. So those head to head games are going to be awesome. They felt like playoff games. You felt like you were watching the two top teams in the North Division, Montreal's kind of falling off. And there's Edmonton as well. I know they've played three more games than the Jets and still have less points. So, uh, and Calgary, again, they had the coaching change too, so they're going to try to get in there. I think those you know, three teams are going to battle out for the final two spots, but give me more Winnipeg-Toronto games any day of the week. Yeah, I mean, they were. Uh, that was a real, real fun week, um, but it's back to business tonight against the Montreal Canadiens. As you mentioned, we'll talk more about the North Division with Dave McCarthy coming up at the bottom of the hour. Leafs still in first place. They've got 40 points in 30 games. And then the Jets are just four points back with 36 and 27. Um, so they do have some games in hand. You get points out of that, and they're basically right there sniffing around first place. Edmonton tied with the Jets at 36, but has played three more games. Of course, these two teams will meet a little later on this week. And then you got the Montreal Canadiens, who are just two up on Calgary. They do have a game on in hand coming off those back-to-back -back regulation losses in Alberta on the way here. Um, there, th this game it does, you know, make me a little nervous, Remus. Um, from one perspective, we know that you know teams coming off road trips, especially good road trips, sometimes have a bit of a lull in that first game back. There was a lot of talk about that from a Leaf perspective last Monday or last Tuesday when the series started um, from uh, in Toronto. But I have to say, I mean, the Jets have been a very, very good home team. And the one reason why I would expect that, you know, maybe we don't have a drop off from the Winnipeg Jets is that, you know, I think they'll have some momentum to take on as a team from the way they performed on Saturday. They also remember how the Montreal Canadiens embarrassed them on national TV 7-1 nine days ago in their last meeting. Yeah, you have to wonder if uh, that taste is still in their mouth, but I think you're feeling good after the game. I think you're feeling good about the way that you played, and if they can play like that in front of Connor Hellbuck, they should have an okay time with, with Montreal. I know we're not at the cool bet line of the day portion of the show, but I think if we're talking about this game tonight we and you know the Jets, how they're playing, I mean, they're ahead of Montreal in the standings. Who is making the odds, and why are the Jets... Why do you think the Jets are underdogs tonight? Does that make any sense at all? It's man, we've been talking about this really since the odds came out at the beginning of the year. The Rodney Dangerfield of the National Hockey League just not getting any respect. And you know, from a Jets fan, you'd like to say, This is garbage. Why aren't people paying attention to the team more? But from a betting standpoint, yeah. it's like, let's just stop talking about this and hopefully it continues on. I mentioned that odd shark stat last week going into uh into the weekend's action. 
And you've got something where it shows that if you just put a hundred dollar bet on a, on a team to win every game this season, where you would be, plus or minus. The number one team in the league was the Carolina Hurricanes. You would have been up seven hundred dollars or so going into the weekend. It was six sixty or six seventy for the Winnipeg Jets at number two, and then they just won as a plus one sixty underdog in Toronto on Saturday. So, um, those that have had faith in the Jets at the betting window have been rewarded so far this season. And you'd have to think that at some point those numbers are going to come down a little bit. But until they do, we'll be more than happy to keep on uh, keep on hitting it. Although this is an interesting game. I still don't know whether I really have a feel for it. Hoping we see a great performance from the Winnipeg Jets. But as I said, Montreal is going to come in, um, you know, I think with a real sense of urgency after losing those last two games to the Calgary Flames. As I mentioned, um, Winnipeg Sports Talk brought to you by Royal Sports. 750 Pembina Highway and 650 Rally NK. Hockey is back. Royal Sports is your number one hockey superstore. So if you need anything to get back on the ice, it's all there at Royal. And as we mentioned, spring is just about here. Bikes, soccer, baseball season all around the corner. Get ready for it right now over at Royal Sports. And Remo, in the comments, I'm seeing some folks asking about merch for Winnipeg Sports Talk. Now, first things first, we need to figure out what the hell we were doing and get this show on the air and get through week number one, which we have done successfully, I believe, now into week number two. So there's a number of things that we will be launching. And speaking of Royal Sports, we might just have to uh, might just have to get some WST gear, send it over to Royal and have people can pop mm-hmm. by at Royal, pick up that and anything the, uh, that we need. It's great to have Royal on board, and that would be a great spot to have Winnipeg Sports Talk merchandise available. Yeah, can we put in an order for some custom uh, New Era hats? That's my, uh, my dream item. I've got a closet full of them. Uh, if we need a designer, I've got an eye on that. And, and I want one of those uh, soft T-shirts. Those are my two, two requests. That's my exclusive wardrobe right now. Soft T-shirts and... Yeah, we'll get... Yeah. The WST 47 brand um, yeah. launch will happen at some point. Maybe we'll get a Mitchell and Ness there, hat as well, and go. certainly the new era. If our Winnipeg sports talk new era hats could be anything as close to the popularity of the infamous TE39 Toby Enstrom limited edition run from earlier in the Jets uh, era, we'll be, uh, we'll be very happy. But anyways, whether we're in there or not, Royal Sports, your number one spot. And of course, our friends... From the Nick and Nikki DQ group, Nick Hajdiako and Nikki with their four DQs, Northgate, Polo Park, Niverville, and St. Anne's. And, uh, you know, we got a great tweet. We've had so much great feedback. But but the Earl of Eli, who was the winner of the DQ cake last week in the YouTube chat, fired out a picture, used it for a happy birthday party for his mom, who is 84 years old. So, Earl, thanks for listening. Congratulations and great that uh, that, that all worked out. Um, okay, back to the Jets. Uh, and again, Dave McCarthy is going to join us in a few minutes. Um, you mentioned Logan Stanley, Remus. And Stanley, I thought, stuck out again for all the right reasons. Um, got his first National Hockey League point. And for all of the pe- for all of the, the way that the narrative has changed around Logan Stanley, which has been quite hilarious, all the people that deemed him a bust before he even got a chance to play in the National Hockey League, all the people that didn't listen to Mark Hillier when they drafted him and said to us at like half an hour after he was picked, this is a very different prospect. This is two years in junior. This is two years in the American Hockey League. And then we think he'll be ready. He's proven that he's ready. He's proving a lot of people wrong. And Reem, I have to say with this injury that's happened to Nate Beaulieu, which is going to take him out for a few weeks and the opportunity for Logan Stanley to play night in and night out, I have a feeling that Logan Stanley is on the verge of Wally Pipping, Nate Beaulieu, um, even when he comes back from injury and really establishing himself as a guy that, you know, will be leaned on by Paul Maurice uh, night in and night out. Yeah, Logan Stanley, I mean, he's uh, a massive, massive guy. He's got a big shot. He can make a good pass. And he's filled in nicely on, on the third pair D. They've put him in a position where he can succeed, and he's definitely done that. And I think at times I, I kind of feel bad for Nate Beaulieu because – he was playing a bit out of his, I don't say position, but in a bit of his role. He was playing top, you know, top minutes with Josh Morrissey. At times, he was even leading the team in minutes. And I don't know if uh, that's really how he wanted to play a guy like Nate Beaulieu. And he had, you know, had a couple of errors in the last couple of games that were very noticeable on a couple of goals. People are talking. Uh, he blocked a shot, and he's hurt. You hope he's okay, but 
I mean, the way he was playing and the way Stanley's playing, I think, you know, give Stanley a better look. And the Jets have had some young guys who have been taken out of the lineup, maybe not because um, of their play, but because of where they are in terms of uh, their seniority level. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, I've always joked that sometimes the Jets seems like it's a bit of a union shop, but, you know, maybe that's the case earlier on. And, you know, listen, Paul Maurice does things in a certain way. I mean, he, um, you know, really does, you know, like and, and really want a, a legit veteran pre- presence on his club in a lot of different areas. Um, and, you know, hey, you know, Trevor Lewis's emergence, I know people are all over Nate Thompson. You don't hear that very much lately. The fourth line's been quite good. Um, just the Beaulieu was, and I think you're right, he was maybe playing a little bit above where he he, he should be. Um, and, you know, there were some issues in and around it. But this isn't about getting on Nate Beaulieu. It's about kind of praising Logan yes. Stanley and saying if he is able to bring that night after night to the Winnipeg Jet lineup – I just think at the end of the day, it's going to be tough to take him out, especially looking ahead, you know, as opposed to a guy that, you know, was signed to sort of be a placeholder as opposed to someone that the Jets did pick in the first round, have been very patient in his development. And I think now are realizing that not only right now can he be effective, but, you know, could be a guy that could be a difference maker at times on that blue line in a depth position going into the stretch drive and potentially the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. We'll wait and see what um, the defense looks like. Obviously, defense, the biggest question coming out of last week. You look at those first two games against Toronto, giving up so many shots, so many high-quality chances. They were able to lock it down a bit on Saturday, but I think overall, um, when you're heading into the trade deadline, which is less than a month away, uh, and maybe even less than that when you consider the quarantine period and you want to have a guy in on the roster, um, you know, I think there are going to be some changes to the defense. So we'll wait and see what happens, but that was the big topic today, has the defense and the upcoming trade deadline, among other things. When GM Kevin Dayoff spoke today, I guess a lot of people are asking him, you know, want to get a midseason update, you know, uh, how's the last year been uh, dealing with the whole uh, COVID situation. So he gave uh, his, you know, I guess state of the season address earlier today. And we all know how Chevy is. Has. He's not going to give, he's going to give you a little, probably not give you a lot. But uh, it seems like they are looking at all areas, taking calls, having conversations, you know, the stuff that uh, GMs usually do around, you know, as we approach the trade deadline. Well, listen, the best part of Shevel Dayoff's um, appearance today um, to the media was it gave some interesting Jets fan or troublemaker the opportunity to um, throw out a fake tweet that said Dustin Bufflin was announcing that he was coming back. And needless to say, that got some run on social media with a number of people going, is this true? Could this happen? Folks, just ride with the blue check marks when uh, someone's making a big announcement or anything like that. Um, No buff coming back, but as we mentioned, a big guy on the blue line, Logan Stanley, kind of establishing himself. He'll be back in the lineup tonight. We will have Carey Price going up against Connor Hellebuck in net this evening. And the Jets go into this game four points back of the Toronto Maple Leafs with three games in hand. And real one other note for the Jets. And as I said, we'll get to a bunch of the other stories from the weekend. Briar, the golf, Jose Canseco's deranged tweets a little bit later on afterwards. But um, Nick Ehlers gets a third star of the week. Uh, very much earning it. He's been so dangerous lately. The offense really is going three goals, three assists in those three games games against Toronto, helping the Jets get five of six. Uh, nice little rec- recognition for a guy that many Jet fans will tell you has been um, you know, the Jets' best winger this season. Yeah, he's been pretty um, underrated throughout the league and even on his own team. Look, he doesn't get power play one time. Uh, in three-on-three overtime, he's not he's not first out on the ice, but uh, he's w- one of the top stars of the week. Very good against Toronto. One, one game he had, uh, what, two assists. The next game he had two goals. And you saw him one of those two goals in game two. I mean, that shot that he has, uh, that one-timer, the whip on that stick uh, is pretty awesome to watch. And then on Saturday, he had the bit, you know, the quick wrister and very nice screen by Matthew Perot, who I think quietly has is also having a very good season on the fourth line. Uh, Nikolai Ehlers, he's impressive. He can skate, and Cheveldayoff was talking about him today. He told a story how when he went to see him in Halifax, you know, people uh, at the arena are like, hey, you're not getting him ninth overall. And he's doing pretty much uh, what he did in junior. You can see him, you know, skate through the zone every time he gets the puck in his own end. Uh, my ears pick up. What's this guy going to do? 
He's always among, you know, next to McDavid in terms of zone entries. Uh, when you look at that stat, so very good at entering the zone. I love Nikolai Ehlers, and I just hope he gets a, a bit more time. Um, all right. Um, you know, a couple other quick hockey notes. Um, Moose won on the weekend. Eric Comrie back in net. Got to feel good for Eric finally getting in. I heard him talking on the weekend. He had been had... I th- well, he had his four weeks of quarantine. He had two weeks going there, two weeks coming back. He finally got back in, and it's, it's a special win for Eric. 84 wins ties Corey Schneider as the Moose all-time leader in net, so we'll have a chance to set that record. Very appropriate for the guy that spent so much time here in Winnipeg with the organization and the Moose net. And the Western Hockey League got going on the weekend. couple things of note. Wheaties and Ice went at it. The Wheaties get the best of Winnipeg 3-2 in the opener. Um, and I talked to Rod Peterson earlier today. Tons of excitement in Regina as Connor Bedard, the first ever exceptional player in Western Hockey League history, scored two goals in less than a minute in his debut. Um, you're going to want to pay attention to the Regina Pats this year to see this young man, an absolute phenom, and what a start he had. Um, Dave McCarthy is going to come and join us in just a couple minutes. We do want to thank our sponsors, Boston Pizza Winnipeg. Andrew, Chef Chuck, and uh, all that they've got going on. Get ready for the game tonight. Get that Boston Pizza game day pack, spicy pierogi pizza, meteor pizza, case of wings. You can order online at bostonpizza.com or pop in, get the family, hit the dining room, or uh, pop into the lounge. And We just can't wait till the restrictions are uh, loosened a little bit more and we can all get together with people we don't live with in these lounges cheer on the Jets again and have a few cold ones over at Boston Pizza. And as we mentioned off the top of the show, cannot thank Trevor Knott and the Knott Auto Corp team enough. They were the first guys that believed in what we were doing, came on right from day one and front page of the Winnipeg Free Press today, a banner ad supporting Winnipeg Sports Talk. Um, That's um, that's the incredible support we've had from day one from all our sponsors, but definitely wanted to give Knott a special thank you today. All right. Let's get to it. We welcome in our good friend Dave McCarthy from NHL.com and the host of Sunday Brunch and Sirius XM NHL Radio and the owner of the most interesting hat collection in all of sports media. Dave, welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk. It's great to have you back on the uh, we're back talking to you again for the for first time on the new show. Let's just get Dave unmuted here, and then we can, uh, and then we'll be good to go. Reem, can you uh, can you unmute Dave? Okay, Dave, I think you may need to uh, unmute yourself. We're uh, working through some special, well, all this new technology each and every time. We'll get Dave on right away and uh, make sure that we can hear Dave. There we are. Yeah, we've got Dave. We can hear you now. We just need to get you back in front of the uh, camera, and we're. uh, We'll be good to go. What a uh, what a great seamless operation we have here. But it is great to have Dave oh, on the it's... program again. If you haven't um, seen or heard Dave on Sirius XM NHL Radio, check that out Sunday mornings. Um, talking all things National Hockey League, and of course, checking out Dave's work at NHL.com. Um, Dave, so uh, what'd you think of uh, last week with Leafs Jets series finishing up on Saturday night? Yeah, uh, do you got me on the camera? By the way. I don't have you on the camera. I've got uh, a shot of, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but we can hear you right now. Oh, yeah, okay. maybe it's just, oh, that's what it is. It's uh, moving around. We've got your hand now in front of the camera. It looks, uh, uh I got to flip this around. How do I do that? Oh, your man. Fin- check your uh, fingerprints. Well, how about we just do this? There, <laughs> there we are. There we are. It's okay. all coming together. It's all coming together. Great to all see right. you. All right. Yeah, great to be on. It's like we say on the brunch, fighting off the technical gremlins here. But, uh, no, congratulations on the new venture. I'm loving it, uh, Huss. It's great to see you and uh, Michael up going again. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what. Uh, I picked, if we all recall, uh, the Jets as the best team in this North division uh, coming into the season. I, I really like this team. I thought top through bottom, uh, their forward core is the best in this division. Uh, do they have the best individual players in this division? Probably not, no, because I think uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl would, would probably be better um, individual for individual than anybody on the Jets team. And I think you know probably Matthews, maybe Marner might be there as well. But just on the whole, 
I think this Jets team from lines one through four is the deepest. And I always concentrate. I key in on that, Huss, uh, when I'm looking at, at teams that can go deep. Um, I want teams where there isn't a precipitous drop-off from, say, the second line to the third line to the fourth line. And, and, and part of the issue right now in, in Edmonton is that, and part of the issue in Toronto uh, is that. But Winnipeg, line for line, is, is one that can make an impact on a, uh, on a nightly basis, like the cop lowry appleton line the other night. Um, somebody asked Paul Maurice, so what do you think of your third line? He's like, well, I wouldn't number them three. That's how good they were. Um, and, and that's really what uh, Winnipeg, to me, is all about. Um, obviously, the goaltending is, is, is next level with Connor Hellebuck. And if Tim uh, Sheveldayoff can, um, or uh, Kevin Sheveldayoff, Tim, Tim Sheveldayoff, old name for the past there. Wow. <laughs> old Jets uh, goalie. Kevin, right, exactly. Kevin Sheveldayoff can make a move at the, uh, the deadline to upgrade on, uh, on uh, the blue line. I really like what this Winnipeg team is all about. Well, and Dave, you know, if you're speaking about the top players in the North Division, and really you can talk about top players in the league, and Connor McDavid will be there, and Leon Dreisaitl will be there, and Austin Matthews will be in that conversation. But one name that has not up until this point been, you know, kind of thrown around with those players, and maybe there's a reason to that with position, when do we start putting Connor Hellebuck in that group? Because the show he put on in those first couple games, if people weren't already realizing just how good this guy is, they saw it in spades in games one and two of the three-game set. Well, I think he should be, but I think we have a tendency, rightly or wrongly, subconsciously or not, to um, separate goalies from skaters when we make that declaration of, you know, best player, so to speak. Um, but But we shouldn't because... Connor Hellebuck, the, the, the efforts he put forward on Tuesday and Thursday last week against the Maple Leafs was, was some of the best net mining that I've seen this season, and, and quite frankly, in quite some time. Um, yeah, at, at, at that level, like we're talking not just, not just Vesna consideration, but Hart Trophy consideration, I think, to me, because that's really just how good he was. Now, the issue is if you're Winnipeg, you don't want to have to rely on your goalie to that extent. You start to pl- start to play with fire a little bit when you do that. Um, but if they can tighten up, and they looked a lot tighter as a group on Saturday, so I think the the opportunity is there for that to happen. Uh, if they can do that, it's nice to have that type of goalie uh, back there. So you know, to me, he's he's far and away the best goalie in this division. Um, and, and I think he's he's the best goalie in the league this year. I, I think he's quite quite honestly us uh, through through half the season. I mean, it's his Vesna Trophy to lose, and if he keeps this up, I think he'll he'll start to knock on the Hart Trophy's door as well. Well, and anyway, and that was what was so interesting about the game on Saturday, Dave. Is that you know we saw what Hellebuck did to get the win in the first game, and I think many would say he was actually maybe even better in game number two, the game that they ended up losing in OT. So they get three out of four points, kind of maybe feel like they stole a couple. And then you really wonder what we were going to see on Saturday night. And I don't know, I was surprised that Hellebach knew the way he played in those last two games wasn't going again on Saturday. Mm -hmm. where He's talked about the reason why he did. And Loren Brassois didn't actually have a great start, let that early goal in. Of course, it was disallowed off the hand pass. I thought the second goal was a little bit shaky. Um, but he was able to shut the door down. But the real difference in the game was a complete 180 in the amount of high danger scoring chances. I mean, the Leafs were, I think it was 20 to five or something in the game before Saturday night, it ended up 14 to three in Winnipeg's favor. Um, Was this a terrible game by the Leafs? Were the Jets that much better? Is the truth somewhere in the middle? What, What did you see on Saturday night and how different was it from the first two games of the three game set? Yeah, I think, Probably like in a lot of these uh, situations, the truth does lie somewhere in the middle. But but give the Jets credit; they were better on Saturday as a group. the The disallowed goal uh, was 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 good. It was almost like a do over, and I think that almost shocked the Jets into thinking, "Okay, like let's we got away with one here. Let's really dial in." And from from then on in, they were they were much better. Um, the Leafs haven't been good though uh, since they left Edmonton. Like they better head back to Edmonton and pick up their team because they left it there. Um, we haven't seen that team since they didn't, they, they were no good against Vancouver. And quite frankly, I didn't think they were, they were really any good against Winnipeg. Um, and then they were brutal against Ottawa on Sunday. So uh, the Leafs 
there is a level of concern right now, I think, if you're Sheldon Keefe, because we've seen a lot of the old habits from 2019-20. That group seep back in, just poor puck management, uh, terrible decisions with the puck, um, listless, no energy, uh, losing more puck battles than you win. And when when that's the case, you're going to end up on the wrong side of a lot of games. But the Jets, I thought... um, that, that, to me, if I'm Paul Maurice, is something that I point to and build on and say, look, this is the type of team that, that we can be when we really uh, dial in as a group and, <laughs> and make sure we're, we're taking care of our own end um, and we're playing on the right side of guys. When they do that, um, you know, whether or not they make an upgrade on the blue line, they're a much better team. But, uh, but I think it, it would help if they could. Man, I look at Matthias Ekholm in Nashville. you got a year oh. left of certainty mm. On that deal, I mean, it might take something to to get him, and 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 that price may be something that Kevin Shevelyov may not be willing to pay. But on the other hand, I, I I look at this this season and the way the path to the conference finals is shaping up, and um, there is a, a clear definable path to the third round. If you're a team like Winnipeg or Edmonton or Toronto, that that is not as easily definable in a in a conventional year, and you know, it doesn't. If you hang a Stanley Cup banner on the rafters of, of Bell MTS Place, it says 2021 on it. It's going to be all fans are interested in. They're not going to say, "Ah, you know what? That was that year." No, no, none of that. <laughs> we want a Stanley Cup. So it's pretty enticing with the group that they have. I would really look at trying to upgrade if if I could, because I think that they're a, sort of a piece away to me on the blue line uh, to really becoming a top tier contender. Yeah, listen, listen, that's a conversation we had all last week here in Winnipeg. And really, it dates back to, you know, going into the season, knowing what the situation was and just seeing how everything settled. Um, Billy Hanel and Dylan Sandberg are developing and playing big minutes with the Manitoba Moose right now. And it was Logan Stanley that got into the mix. And Dave, Logan Stanley's fascinating. Outside of the market, you may not have been aware of the narrative around Logan Stanley. But, you know, it was a pick that was panned by many early on. The organization said, this is a player, don't think of him like Patrick Laine. Think of him as a guy that's going to be two years in junior and then a couple years in the American Hockey League, and then we'll see what this man will be, but we think that he can be good. That's Mm -hmm. exactly what has happened. A lot of people had written him off a couple years ago. Um, He comes in, plays well for the first 13 games, spends a long time out of the lineup, and then comes back into these Leaf series, gets his first NHL point on Saturday night, and really has you know, acquitted himself well as the guy that, you know, you can throw out there and not be um, not be counting down the seconds until the shift is over. I mean, you were there on Saturday night. Uh, yeah. hard, hard to miss Logan Stanley when he's out there because of how big he is, but um, there wasn't a lot of chaos around him when he was out on the ice. Thoughts on and, another big guy? Big guy. Yeah, well, that's, that's what you want when a guy like him is on the ice. Just don't notice him all that much. Let's not have a lot of chaos. Let's not have him running around. But what an intriguing player Logan Stanley is to me. Um, See, we live in this society, Huss, where everybody's instant gratification, right? I want to buy that now. I need this today. I want that, you know. And and same thing when it comes to prospects. And, and, you know, to a large extent, guys like Matthews and Line A and McDavid, um, they've ruined it for a lot of guys over the last number of years because now it's like, oh, you draft a guy, we should be in your lineup the next year helping you out. Well, that's not the case for guys lower in the draft, especially bigger guys. It's it's draft and develop, right? Like it's two <laughs> parts to, to, to putting together a young hockey player. Everyone wants to draft, but then they want to go from draft to play. Draft, develop, and then play. And he's still a young guy, and that's what the, the, the Jets have done a really good job of. Um, to me with Logan Stanley is they've developed the guy really well like look a couple of examples that come to mind one jake bean down in carolina is about the same age as logan stanley uh carolina drafted him quite some time ago i remember talking to him at the 2017 um nhlpa rookie showcase at maple leaf gardens and he told me that year like four plus almost five years ago now that he hoped he had played his last game of junior well he played two more years of junior then he played a couple of years in the (laughs) ahl and now he's finally um taking uh, his opportunity at the NHL level and he's running with it. Um, and, and when it comes to Logan Stanley, different players, I mean, Logan's more of a defensive guy, but we need to look no further. And again, not to compare him to this guy, cause that's not fair to the kid, but 
but I think you try to look at examples and project about what a guy could be. There's a man turning 44 years of age on Thursday. <laughs> the man is the man's name is Zidane Ochara. Took him a long time to get going in the NHL, right? Like he was this gangly, kind of awkward looking player that was huge, but man, he just he seemed like he was all over the place. And then he started to refine his game and he started to get more comfortable and he started to figure out what he could bring and that he realized he didn't need to go chasing guys around the ice. He needed to get to his position and then use his reach, which is as long as a giraffe. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's what Logan Stanley should look at. Look at clips of Zdeno Chara early in his career and see how his game has evolved to where it is today because I think that's what he should try to project himself to be a guy that clears out the front of the net, a guy that's a terrific penalty killer. Um, you don't need him scoring 20 goals a year from the back end. That's, that's not what his job is, but, but there's a real valuable role for a guy like that who can be sort of your fourth, fifth defenseman eat up uh, 17 to 20 minutes a night. Um, I think the jets have a guy that could really be a helpful player in Logan Stanley. Dave McCarthy of NHL.com and Sirius XM NHL Radio with us today on Winnipeg Sports Talk, kind of wrapping that last week against the Leafs and looking ahead to tonight to begin four games this week in the North for the Jets. Tonight's host, uh, tonight's visitors is the Montreal Canadiens. But Dave, um, you know, Stanley is uh, a player that people are sort of taking notice of now that he is in the lineup. Another guy that outside of the market, I don't think has had no much of any buzz, but probably should is Mason Appleton. What a mm. week he had. Um, what did you think of Appleton? And, um, you know, any did, did his name come up in conversations amongst the Toronto media of some people that maybe were going, like, wait a second, who the heck that's causing all this chaos in front of the Leafs net? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about so much with, with other media members, but I sure as hell noticed the guy. I mean, like that entire third line, uh, any team in the league would trade for right now. I mean, because that is a line that, you know, it's the type of line that a championship team has toward the bottom end of their, their forward core. Uh, Appleton, Lowry, and Cop. Like, I loved how Appleton uh, just continued to get to the net. Like, he, he was, like, he, there was like a, I don't even know what the, uh, what the, um, the metaphor would be. But, like, he, it, he just made it his mission to get to the front of the net all series long. And, and that's that's what what you need out of out of a line like that and when you can get uh, that line like I, I remember Paul uh, Maurice said after I think it was the Saturday game they're no longer just a line that we put out there to hold water for us and hope that they can get off the ice without anything bad happening sure that's that's part of what their job is um, but but now they contribute and and they expect to contribute um, and I think that's that's what's happening with all three of those guys. They're playing with a tremendous amount of confidence where they're showing up to the rink uh, and they're going into the game feeling like they're a part of it and that they know what their job is to do on that particular night. Um, and they have every confidence in the world they're going to go out and do it. So, you know, to me, that's that's the type of line that Tampa Bay built in season last year going out and getting uh, Barkley Gaudreau and and Blake Coleman um, to go along with Anthony Sorelli. Though in that type of line, they, they, they identified that they needed and they went out and they acquired it. Well, I think uh, Winnipeg, by and large, has been able to address that need internally. And that trio that, that they've put together um, is a really, really interesting group, especially when you get get by, you know, the Shifleys and the Wheelers and the Connors, um, and, and the Ehlers uh, and, and the Paul Stastny's that have been doing their work up top, then you throw that third line out there. And I think for a lot of teams right now, they're a mismatch. And that gives you an edge, not obviously just during the regular season, but certainly when you get into a playoff series. And I think that that's kind of what we saw this week, right? Because it was like a playoff series with the Leafs playing three games. And as the series went on, that line just just wore the leaves down and they started to become big difference makers as as the series went on. Dave, we here in Winnipeg, we're now focusing on the Montreal Canadiens and Edmonton Oilers this week, but I, I'm interested in your thoughts on the Leafs coming out of this week. Um, you know, I thought they played very well in the first two games. Um, they had they got two points to show for it. 
Didn't play very well Saturday. Got thumped by Ottawa last night. Um, they've been comfortably at the top of the division all season long. Where are the Leafs right now going into a couple days off this week? Not in a real good place. Uh, Morgan Riley said after the game on Saturday, Saturday that we got to empty the tank against Ottawa. And then they showed up to, to the rink in Ottawa with their tank already on empty uh, because they had nothing going. So um, it, it's gut check time now for this Leafs team because they could well not be in first by the time they play again on Friday against uh, Daryl Sutter's boys uh, from, from Calgary. Uh, because, you know, Winnipeg obviously has got some games this week. They could catch them. Um, I thought they played okay on, on Tuesday and Thursday. You know, Hellebuck was really good. But um, I also look to the way they, they managed the puck on their own and the, the chances that they gave up. And, you know, was Freddie Anderson up to Connor Hellebuck's level? No, but no one was going to be up to Connor Hellebuck's level the way uh, he was playing in those two games. And... Even though, you know, Anderson was not at his best, I had a hard time pointing to a lot of goals that that I thought he should have stopped. Like, I think it was on the, uh, would have been on the uh, the Friday game, or the Thursday game. Um, you know, the, the Matthews, or the goal that Matthews kicked in when he was doing, I don't know what the heck he was doing in the slot, just let Freddie <laughs> stop that. You know, he, he stops that 100 times out of 100. You get your leg in front of it, it goes in. Um, the pass that Morgan Riley made from his uh, face-off dot in his own end to the opposing blue line across the ice, like, you know, where is that going? And Matthews was below his man at the time. That pass didn't have a hope. And uh, and then as soon as as soon as that was turned over, Matthews was below his man. So it was a three on one back the other way. I think that was the Appleton goal. Um, like that's that's not winning hockey. Yeah, the goalie at the other end was unreal. And maybe if he wasn't quite that that good, you would have won. But even if you would have won, you would have looked at that game and said, yeah, OK, we kind of outscored our problems. But teams that that play that loose. Um, and, and show that level of lack of crispness and tightness in their game. You might make the playoffs. You might win a round. You're not winning a Stanley Cup. So if that's the case, who the hell cares what your goalie's doing because you're not going to win anyway. So that's what the Leafs really need to, to, to tighten up because the way they played against the Oilers, um, Huss, that was the best I've seen this team play, quite honestly, under this current iteration of this group, like the Matthews, Marner, Nylander era. Um, I've never seen them played like that before. And coming out of that Oilers, that Oilers series, you know, I thought to myself, man, that's the team that I'm talking about. That's the team that can contend for a Stanley Cup. Um, not the team that I saw against the Winnipeg Jets. Whether or not Hellebuck uh, you know, stood on his head or not. Even if the Leafs had gone 3-0 three, uh, three and o, uh, this week against, uh, against Winnipeg, um, it's not good enough to win long term. So that that to me is is where is where my concern with this Leafs team lies right now. Their 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 inability to be crisp and manage the puck effectively. Dave, we saw Daryl Sutter make an immediate impact with the Calgary Flames. They beat the Montreal Canadiens in their uh, last couple games, and now the Habs come to town. Um, you know, with not even the newest coach in the in the uh, division and Dominic Ducharme because of the two firings over the past month. Um, just what were your thoughts on Montreal and where they're at right now? Um, you know, especially considering they got, you know, what we thought would be a bit of an early bump. It didn't happen against the Jets. They got that one big game with the 7-1 win. And then now we're coming off some couple more regulation uh, losses. I, I'd imagine the urgency for both of those teams um, is really getting cranked up right now because of the amount of time that's coming through the hourglass as we get into the second half of the season. Yeah, it gets late early this year, right? With a shortened season. Um, my my thoughts on Montreal. I, I I like the changes that they made in the off season. I mean, obviously Toffoli and Anderson had an immediate impact, and Nick Suzuki was playing really well, and Isperi Kotkaniemi was looking pretty good at the beginning of the year. Um, but but then obviously they 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 hit a, a huge huge hurdle. And now I think it's about building back up to, to where they are. Care Price didn't play good at the beginning of the year, and now he's starting to play a little bit better, which is which is a good sign because they kind of won almost in spite of him at the beginning of the year. And now um, that he seems to be a little bit better, 
uh, after he went to work with a goalie coach for like a day and then the goalie coach got fired and that was a weird situation, but he's been better. <laughs> he's been, I mean, I, whatever he told him seemed to work, but then, you know, Stefan Wade lost his job. So I don't know what happened there. Um, and, and what impact Sean Burke has been able to have over things like this, uh, not getting to work with him in person yet, but he's been better. So, you know, hopefully now if you're Montreal, Carey Price can, can help buy the rest of the group some time uh, to get back to where they were at the beginning of the year and then everything balances out. I, I think they're going to make the playoffs, um, you know, but Calgary's going to put on a push here. Like those were a big couple wins for them last week, both in regulation against Montreal. Uh, mm-hmm. That really that really closed the gap. And what I've liked out of Calgary is that Daryl Sutter seems to have established an identity already. Like when you talked about Calgary before, it was always like, okay, hey, what are they? Are they a skilled team with, with Goudreau and Monaghan? Well, no, not really, because when they're not on the ice, uh, they don't really have a, a ton of skilled players. Okay, well, are they a, uh, a tough, rugged team that wears you down when, you know, Matthew Kachuk's on the ice? Well, yeah, maybe when he's on the ice, but but not really, because then they kind of play loose and free, and uh, but they don't have that, that level of skill. You know, are they playing a structured game? Well, no, because it seems like there's a welcome mat in front of the goal crease on a lot of nights. Um, so, like, what are they? Daryl Sutter already in the two games has brought structure to this group um, and he's made the defensive zone an unpleasant place for the offensive team and you're not going to get to the front of the net nearly as easily um, now against Calgary so I think that's going to be their identity is try to win games low scoring it's Daryl Sutter hockey it's boring but if they're winning Hmm. Flames fans won't be complaining everybody Hmm. else around the league will but Flames fans want to see W's right now. And it'll be interesting to see how this division, Huss, I think, shapes up maybe a week from now um, with the Leafs on idle and the Jets and the Flames and the Oilers and the Habs playing some meaningful games. Could have a different horizon um, in that North Division a week from now. Well, absolutely. And, you know, if you look at the, you know, the projections, uh, you know, the numbers, chances of making the playoffs right now, Toronto, Winnipeg and Edmonton, all pretty comfortable and then it really comes down to, you know, Montreal and Calgary with an outside shot. I think Vancouver's at 8% right now. Um, but just as it pertains to Montreal and Calgary, Dave, I, mean, I think you look back at those two games last week, I think it speaks to why Calgary made the decision that they did when they did. Because, you know, if Calgary's able to get back into it and actually qualify as the fourth team ahead of Montreal, look no further than those two games last week that really mm-hmm. would be the catalyst to turning around their season and getting back in. Biggest thing for Calgary is, you know, we don't don't know what team you're going to get night in and night out. They've been the most inconsistent team in the division so far this season. That, of course, it seems is number one priority of Daryl Sutter to try to get a bit more of a consistent effort from his team. If you do that, we'll have a bit better chance of actually putting together a string of wins. Yeah, I mean, Montreal could have pretty well finished the Flames off if they'd won uh, two in regulation last week but but they didn't so they've they've let them up off the mat calgary still got some work to do but they have a chance now where mm-hmm. before those two games i don't think they, they they really did if they had lost both in in regulation um but see like the thing with with daryl is he expects work um and and he identifies what each player needs to do and what he needs out of each guy and then he expects each guy to only do what he's being asked to do. He's really good at identifying roles for players. Um, and, and, and that's, that's good because I think a lot of Calgary's issue is that they had everyone kind of running around almost being independent contractors on a, on a lot of nights trying to do their own thing. And you know, some nights they'd catch lightning in a bottle and it would work. And then other nights, most nights it, it wasn't working. Um, so you you can you can put consistency to work when you show up to the rink with a plan, and I think that's what Daryl's put in place. And you know, I tell you, the the group on paper to me should be a lot better than we've seen out of it for the last number of years. Like this, to me, it's it's really the last kick at the can for this this iteration of that group. Because if you think about it, I think we we think of Calgary as a team that's always been pretty good over the last four or five or six years. You know how many playoff rounds they've won with Goodrow and Monaghan on the roster? One. And that was in 2014-15. Like, they really haven't gotten all that much done. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of the, the, the old 
Dion mm-hmm. Phaneuf, Joffrey Lupul, mm-hmm. Phil Kessel, Phil Kessel leaves. It's like they were always kind of in the mix, knocking on the door. And then you realize, like, okay, that's as good as they're going to be. And if that's as good as they're mm-hmm. going to be, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you get in, maybe you don't. But even if you get in, you're not winning anything with that group. Um, this is what Calgary has to, to figure out and decide is, is, is can they win with this group, the Monahans and the Goodrows and the Kachaks. I mean, Giordano is still a good player, but he's getting later on in his career anyway, so not really the same same thing. But it's more the, the, the forwards. Uh, or do well, they let me ask you this. Move? Let me hit you with this. Um, so Daryl Sutter is, takes over for the rest of this year. And, you know, i got a three-year deal. There's two more years yeah. on the contract. Who lasts longer in Calgary, Johnny Gaudreau or Daryl Sutter? It's a good question. It's a good question. See, I think you bring in a guy like Daryl um, because you, you want to see if if you have that opportunity with this with this group. And maybe if you're Brad Trey Living, um, you you cajole ownership into uh, if this year doesn't pan out. Uh, giving it one more kick at the start of next season um, and see how you, you start once Darryl's got a full training camp um, and, and all that. And if you get off to a good uh, good start through October and November and into December, okay, well, then you, you, you run with it and see what you, what you might have. Um, and I, I think that would be reasonable because you're asking a lot to come in midway through a short year where you barely ever get to practice um, and, and try to salvage. It almost reminds me of the Ken Hitchcock situation in Edmonton where they tried to do that, what, a couple years ago, try and salvage the season, and they just eventually ran out of racetrack. But, you know, that was different because it was a one-year thing, and Ken didn't, didn't continue on past that. I think you could give it into the fall to see how it pans out. But I think if it is kind of what you see through most of this year, um, into October, November, and December next year, and it's not going well, that's when I think you could start to see um, a lot of uh, rumors and trade winds swirl around guys like Gudrow and Monaghan and, and, and maybe make a deal like that in advance of, of next season's trade deadline. It's kind of how I see that one playing out. I think it would be maybe a little bit foolhardy to, to, to kick that can over the edge right away if this year doesn't go how, how you, how you hope it does in Calgary, just like I say, cause you don't have a lot of time, but give Daryl a full training camp, see how it goes. And I think, um, you know, what are we in March, you know, like January of 2022, that's when you could start to see it. If, if things aren't continuing to go well in, in Calgary, Dave McCarthy with us from Sirius XM NHL radio and read all of his work, uh, at NHL.com and give him a follow. If you haven't already at Dave A. McCarthy. Okay. Dave, last question. I'm going to bring it back to the jets all season long. Um, Remus and I have been talking. The listeners have been noticing when we're doing our betting lines, we're always pointing it out. The jets are consistently overlooked and undervalued. They're once again, a home underdog tonight to the Montreal Canadians. Why aren't poor people, and especially, I mean, if you want to really see how things are working, follow the numbers and see where the money's at. The Jets, again, a home underdog tonight. Why are, why is that the case? Why are people, why are more people not paying attention to what's happening in Winnipeg? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it puzzles me. Uh, uh, firstly, I'll say, uh, I hope you're making a few bucks on the Jets if you're, if you're, if you're hammering the good odds here, because it seems like they're a moneymaker. Um, I mean, I'm not a big better, but what I will say is, you know, who sets these lines? Like, honestly, do they, do they watch hockey or or (laughs) they, do they understand the game? Um, Because if, if people who set the lines are overlooking the jets, that's, you know, I mean, up to them and, you know, maybe, maybe you've exposed a good, uh, good money making opportunity here with the, uh, the jets because they wouldn't be, wouldn't be my underdog in their game tonight. That's for sure. Um, but, but I'll go back to what I said earlier in our talk. They haven't been overlooked by me. I picked them to be the best team in this division before the season started. Um, and I still think they, they continue to, to, to trend in that direction. Um, I think they're a, a team that you really have to pay attention to and why people who set betting lines aren't giving them the, uh, the appreciation that they deserve. I don't know, but hey, we'll know. take it right now here in the peg because I know a lot of Jets fans have been sort of hammering that number night in and night out, and it's been yeah. quite profitable so far this year. Dave, um, there. what do you have cooking uh, this week um, at NHL.com, and of course, uh, heading into another award-winning episode of the brunch on uh, next Sunday. 
Maybe for the uh, food that I serve. I don't know so much for the, the quality of the program, but we'll let the listeners decide, as the top man always taught me back in the day. Um, what do we got cooking? NHL.com, bit of a quieter week. Uh, Leaps are off till Friday, so they'll probably, probably be off till Wednesday. Maybe start practicing then. We'll see what happens. Could, uh, could be some good uh, news in the return of Wayne Simmons around the corner. He started skating. Sheldon Keefe said sort of this time last week that this time this week, um, that he would potentially be um, an option to get back into full practices and, and maybe games. He'd be a big help for Toronto just for a shot in the arm standpoint to get him back in the, uh, back in the lineup. So there could be news on that front uh, down the road. And then uh, the brunch, I don't know. We'll see. You don't usually start planning till Wednesday. I got to give myself a couple of days. Otherwise, I just. Who knows? Uh, you, you, might, you might have to do a special talking about the first place Jets. Whoa, did I say that? <laughs> I'm okay with that. It, it would could make be. me look smart. It would make me look smart. I've got, I've got the tweet, Huss, from uh, early January that I threw out my predictions for the North Division. In the bookmarks folder right now on at Dave A. McCarthy. And I'm telling you, it's looking pretty good. I had Vancouver in sixth. I had Ottawa in seventh. I had Winnipeg in first. I had Toronto in second. I had Calgary in there. Edmonton was out. But it could change. I'm, I'm ready to hit retweet on that, baby, if I look smart in a few weeks. Well, you always look smart just because of the hats that you wear, Dave. You're at ne- next level fashion as always. Hey, pal, listen, I love coming on with you. We love, we've always loved having you on the program back in the old days. And uh, now it's even better. Get to see you, talk with you, have a little bit more time to do it. Thanks so much. And uh, we look forward to making this a uh, regular occasion here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it, Huss. And, and congrats again to you and Michael for uh, the great start to your new venture here. I'm loving it. Really makes awesome, me happy. Awesome, Dave. Thanks so much. There he is, Dave McCarthy. Um, give him a follow on Twitter, folks, at Dave A. McCarthy. Check out his work for NHL.com and, of course, at Sirius XM NHL Radio. That was some great stuff with Dave. Always loved talking to him. He was kind of a regular on the warm-up and uh, great to have him on the program. Um, I can tell you tomorrow going to be a great show we had a number of our favorite um tried to pack as many as our, our favorite winnipeg scribes in in week one um we'll continue to do that in week two and tomorrow we'll have scott billick of the winnipeg sun and i gotta i gotta say one thing about scotty is that he has he's maybe been and remo come in i will be interested in your take on this he might be my number one all-star for the pandemic Because Billick, when things got going and we were busy drafting, you know, quarantine grocery items and um, sev runs, Billick was basically becoming the go-to guy for all the information on the pandemic for the Winnipeg Sun. And Remo, now that we're into hockey season, Billick is still cranking out all that important information when it comes to the pandemic, but doing a hell of a job covering every aspect of Winnipeg Jets hockey along with his team at the Sun. Yeah, Scott Billick, uh, I mean, he was my go-to for a long time. Every day, what's he tweeting, what's he tweeting? And even I was looking, you know, this week on my camera roll, it's like on this day last year, and I'm those were the days where you were glued to the news every day, what's going on, what's happening. Maybe not as much t- today, but still definitely a little. But yeah, Scott Billick, double duty on uh, pandemic coverage and Jets coverage. Uh, he's been excellent, so his Twitter is a uh, definitely a must uh, must visit for me. Uh, especially when, uh, you know, during Jets games as well, press conferences, but also press conferences uh, from the province. Yeah, so Paul, so uh, we'll have a nice long segment with Scott tomorrow, um, kind of just figuring out where the Jets are at, talking about tonight's game, looking ahead to the rematch against uh, Montreal on Wednesday, as well as the rest of the week. And, you know, it, it's so much fun, you know, whether we're talking to Winnipeg guys or whether we're talking to guys like Dave elsewhere in Canada. I mean, it's sort of like we're all focused on this one seventeen league right now. Um, with everything going on in the North Division. And, and, and Rio, a couple big ones tonight. I mean, Dave mentioned that the Leafs are off for a few days, gives the Jets opportunity to make up a couple of these games and see if they can get closer to first place. And then, of course, we've got a, another edition of the Battle of Alberta tonight as the Oilers are coming off a Saturday night loss, night loss to the Vancouver Canucks and the Calgary Flames looking to continue their momentum that they've got with those two big regulation wins against the Habs who are here in Winnipeg. Yeah, I'm curious how that one's going to go. Calgary was a mystery uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, fired uh, the coach, Jeff Ward, hired Daryl Sutter. They seem to be finding their game, finding that internal 
uh, motivation that maybe they were lacking. There were some games where they really just um, didn't show up and give that effort, uh, you know, and give the the one ten percent that you're looking for. So we'll see how it goes. Oilers, they've been uh, you know fiddling around with the lines lately, you know, putting uh, McDavid and Drysaddle together. I mean, those guys are elite, elite players. Very tough to shut down. So I'm expecting a, a bounce back here from Edmonton after losing to Vancouver. And those teams, they're neck and neck in the North Division. Calgary just behind, but uh, they've got a couple games back of Edmonton. So. Uh, this is a big one for Calgary. They're going to try to claw back into the race, and I definitely think they're capable of it. Is that they definitely under underachieved early and looking to bounce back now with the new coach and uh, new attitude. All right, uh, here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. Um, there's a number of things that I wanted to get to coming out of the weekend, but many of them tie in to our friends at CoolBet and our daily line. So why don't we get to that first and foremost, uh, pulling up CoolBet.com, going to the NHL page. There it is, Montreal Canadiens at Winnipeg Jets. This game opened as the Jets, a home underdog at plus 105, and the Habs were minus 125. There has been, and I saw Chris Abbott, one of the cool things about CoolBet is they're so, so transparent. They'll let you know who's betting on what, where the money's coming in. It's been heavy on Winnipeg, and I think people are recognizing the way the Jets have played and recognizing this number that, as we just mentioned to Dave, doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface to a lot of people. And maybe it's a tough spot. I'm not saying go out and bet the Jets tonight, but I am saying there's there's no way that they should be an underdog at home considering the way things have been going. So as of right now, at this moment, plus 103. So more than plus money on the Jets to win in any way on the money line against Montreal total for the game is five and a half over minus 119 some of the other games tonight in the league Predators at Lightning man it speaks to just how bad Nashville is right now and how good Tampa is but Tampa minus 323 favorite by far the biggest number on the board this uh, this uh, tonight um even way more than the Washington Capitals who were playing Buffalo Washington a minus 227 favorite couple of the other, you know, closer games tonight, Flyers and Rangers. Philly, a very slight favorite on the road in at New York. And as we mentioned later on tonight, Battle of Alberta is back in the Saddle Dome. Calgary, a minus 120 favorite. The Oilers, plus 103. Now, a great tie-in to Coolbet, of course. And many, if you, if you haven't seen the show that I'm doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays with my pal Dustin Nielsen from Edmonton, it is called The Lock Shop. We've been having a lot of fun making bets and making picks, mainly in the National Hockey League. I got heavy into the curling over the last few weeks, the golf as well. And Remus, um, you may have seen this on Twitter yesterday, but it was a, a record-setting week for The Lock Shop. Now 9-3 and three in our Plus Money Underdogs, or I am so far, had Calgary on the weekend. Dusty had the Jets at plus 160, we basically nailed all the picks, and then to top it off, a 20 to 1 winner on the PGA Tour from last Tuesday's show with Justin Thomas at 20 to 1. Um, you know, the Jets have been winning, but the lock shop has been winning as well. So, um, considering the amount of heat you get when you go on a losing streak and you have a bunch of terrible picks, we'll just uh, do the old Barry Horowitz today. Things are hot right now at the lock shop. We'll have another show tomorrow, and I'm hoping that Dustin Nielsen can join us on Friday. It'll be a great time. We'll do lock shop later on, but you know, I figure in between the two Edmonton games, perfect time to bring in Dusty, who uh, of course is covering the uh, Oilers and all things um, in Edmonton out there with uh, with twelve sixty. Um, but Justin Thomas, man, uh, Reem, th that golf tournament. I mean, the players is the big money event outside of the majors all season long. And, you know, it seemed going out into the weekend, there was maybe a chance he'd get in there. Uh, but what a thrilling final round, which included, you know, one of the best tee to green performances we've seen some anyone in recent uh, PGA history. Missed the 18th green by about three inches, and that would have been 18 for 18 on the greens. Um, but JT gets a big win at 20 to 1, a number that we probably won't be seeing anytime soon for a guy that spent so much time as the number one player in the world. Yeah, number one player. He's the cover guy on the PGA Tour video game. Um, you know, we've heard yes, he so is. much about him, uh, up and coming player, 20 to 1. I mean, that's a number you look at. And you're like, hey, these, this guy, I think he's a better player than 20 to 1. 
and you throw down and look golf sometimes about you know making a guess taking the value and I don't want to say getting lucky but you put in your best uh, you know what you know and sometimes the chips fall your way and I'm just kicking myself here that I didn't tell you guys on Saturday what was I doing I saw the tweet about Justin Thomas, and I was like, yeah, okay, that's that's cute, and uh, didn't didn't do the vet, and this has like, happened a couple times where you're on a guy, and I see it, I'm like, yeah, okay, it's interesting, and don't don't act on it, and now I'm sitting here again, kicking myself, and I've had a number of people, I know there's people in chat who tailed you guys on Justin <laughs> Thomas, and, uh, you know, have a few extra bucks in their wallet now, so uh, yes. I'll give you guys... The pat on the back, the Barry Horowitz. Thank you. Uh, so congratulations to you guys, and uh, I'll have to tune in tomorrow to the lock shop. Yeah, we'll be uh, firing that out probably. Well, during the day, we'll get it done before um, the show. So, uh, you know, follow my Twitter. We'll tweet it out. But usually in between 11 and 12 a.m. on uh, or noon on Tuesday, we'll get that out. And then we'll do an evening show on Friday heading into the Saturday uh, events. Uh, give us a follow on Twitter at lock shop bets. And uh, you'll be able to subscribe to uh, the podcast feed as well, uh, either at Spotify or at iTunes. One of the other things that, you know, I mean, I've been talking a lot of curling. And again, I'm not a curling guy for about 11 out of 12 months. But once the Scotties and the Briars comes, um, all over it. Um, I did that show Friday morning with Chris Abbott from Cool Bet talking about the championship round. And um, I, again, you know, botcher. And Dunstone to make the playoffs. Those both went in. And then Botcher getting it done. He was plus 450 heading into the championship round. He was plus 250 yesterday. Um, but listen, I was supporting the Manitoba guys. I was really hoping that Man Matt Dunstone could get it done for Saskatchewan after 41 years of a drought. They were phenomenal all week. And they just got beat by simply the best team in the field. That double uh, raised, or the raised double to win for botch uh, for botcher in the uh, bottom of the 10th end was just i mean one of those legendary shots it got them to the final and um i did get some tweets and texts though and i'm interested if anyone paid attention in the uh, in the chat um i brought this up last week saying maybe curling should consider you know two consecutive blanks losing the hammer I mean, at one nothing after six ends i think a lot of people were saying all right guys i mean it would be nice to maybe have another scoring end or two. Um, but man, it was thrilling. It was tense. And you just have to feel great for Botcher. I mean, he just seems to be the nicest, most salt of the earth guy, um, loved by all competitors and won the sportsmanship award this year before the final played. I mean, they had lost in three straight Briar finals. They avoid becoming the Buffalo Bills of Canadian curling and get a very well-deserved first Canadian championship. And they will be playing uh, representing Canada at the Worlds. Of course, the Women's Worlds is happening now in the bubble. And Remo, for the curling people that figured that maybe it was all over, I have news for you. It is not over, and I am so geeked for this. On Thursday, the Canadian Mixed Doubles Championships begin. 35 teams. Remember, the Mixed Doubles, it's six ends. It's two on two, one male, one female, we really got into this for the first time at the Olympics when John uh, Morris and our own Caitlin Laws won the gold medal. It's totally different than in normal curling, as you see, but I think it's imminently watchable. Um, it's fast-paced. It's fun. It's new. Um, and I think the more that this gets on TV, the more people that are going to be into it. And I'm happy to say I've got the word from Chris at Cool Bet. We will have odds on Canadian mixed curling, although it won't start right at the beginning of the event. I mean, they don't really have any data on any of the teams, so I think they're going to need to get a few days into play before they start getting lines on it. But I'm pretty sure these games are going to be on, on TSN. And I got to tell you, if you haven't checked out the mixed curling, you should do it because it is wild. I can't wait for it. Yeah, I would have never thought uh, betting on curling would be such a big thing, but uh, you've been uh, preaching <laughs> the whole time, even doing uh, shows uh, on strictly and giving out a lot of winners, which is in which is incredible. I, I have spent more time studying and trying to get ready for these curling picks than maybe anything else, and it did go quite well. But the mix is a whole different yeah. beast. I think of it as the NBA jam of curling has uh, two versus two, <laughs> arcade style, uh, fast paced, uh, six ends, uh, which is very nice. Uh, you don't have that uh, slog of uh, of ten ends. So uh, I'll, I'll watch it. It's uh, it's on TV. 
And I got to give full credit, Hus, to Curling Canada. Uh, the way they've put this on in the bubble, it's gone real well. I know yes. there's a lot of concerns when they uh, announced it, if it was going to be able to happen. Uh, you know, I think a year later, we all have an idea of the steps that we need to take and what needs to be done. And credit to them uh, for a very successful Briar and Scotty's. But as you said, it's not done. All right, hey, everyone. Great to say, man. We're just maintaining yep. great numbers throughout the YouTube show. For everyone that's listening afterwards, if you ever want to go and check out the video, um, definitely just go to Winnipeg Sports Talk on YouTube. Make sure to hit the subscribe button. Give us a like. Throw a comment in there. And actually, for everyone that's here right now, um, let's get some predictions for tonight's game. We won't talk about the entire week. How are you feeling? Are you nervous about the first game mm -hmm. back after the homestand? Or are you feeling that this Winnipeg Jets team is really sort of getting it together? Connor Hellebuck's back in net, and they started off with a nice win. Throw your predictions into the comments. Um, Reem, uh, do you have a feeling on this game tonight? I mean, where's the uh, where's the confidence level coming off such a great performance on Saturday, knowing you know this team's been building, but you're always a little nervous after the uh, travel day and coming back at home after this road trip against a team that we know is going to be in an ornery mood after these two straight regulation losses. But the Jets are going to remember two Saturdays ago as well. Yeah. Um, before I get into that, I, just, I do you do mention everyone in chat. Uh, shout out to everyone in there, everyone who's hit the like button up to 190 likes. Uh, thank you all, and we do have a channel announcement. We did hit 3,000 followers or subscribers on YouTube just recently, so in under two weeks. Did we? Yeah, we just hit 3,000, so a uh, huge milestone. Yes! So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We're we're totally overwhelmed by all the support. Uh, this is absolutely insane to have so many people here in the afternoon, uh, but... Uh, we're looking at the predictions. We see 4-1, Jets 3-2, 4-3, 5-2, Winnipeg. I, I was going to go with 4-3, Jets. Maybe we'll see another overtime. I, I do think from the, the Jets in the past, we have had that letdown game coming off a road trip. But I think they should be flying high. They should be happy about the way that they've played. And, yes, they will have that bad taste in their mouth of Montreal taking it to them uh, last Saturday. Not the one that just happened, but the one before that. So I'm leaning Jets. I think it's criminal. Uh, that they, how are they an underdog at home when they're ahead of Montreal in the standings? Hey. It really makes no sense to me. As I said, you know, um, the Winnipegger in me gets bent out of shape about it and says the team deserves more respect. And then the better in me goes, we should just shut up about this and be happy and take it because it's a lot better than them being overvalued and have to bet an extra 20 or 50 bucks to get what you think you should deserve out of the game. Um, now, Remo, you know, we've hit all the big stories, the golf, the curling, tons of hockey coming out. There were a couple of other interesting things that happened on the weekend. Namely, I was very concerned yesterday. I saw Old Dutch trending on Twitter, and I thought that maybe Old Dutch was getting canceled. But no, that wasn't, in fact, the case. Old Dutch, far from getting canceled. Um, but it was National Potato Chip Day. And I believe it was Sid Sixero put out a a list of chips. And I think he had like Lay's ketchup or something like that first overall. No mention of Old Dutch. And it got a lot of people fired up um, as a, and you know, there's some people will have takes on a lot of things. And I say stay in their lane. The one thing that we will do on this show, we'll talk about sports, but I don't think there's anything that this grouping here on Winnipeg Sports Talk is more qualified to talk about than junk food and fast food and to even think that a Lay's chip is in the in the stratosphere in the same area code the same level as old dutch is is an affront to anyone that's ever eaten a potato chip yeah i'm i'm a big fan of Lay's, but when it comes to ketchup chips there's no question old dutch ketchup absolutely number one uh, that is my favorite as well i'm a big fan of dutch crunch Original Dutch Crunch Mesquite Barbecue, Dutch Crunch uh, Jalapeno. It's, they're delicious. And I know there were a lot of people saying Dutch Crunch in the box versus in the bag. And I think I'm a, maybe a, a box guy. It does help with uh, portion control and helps with freshness control also. But yeah, old, yeah. old Dutch. I'm also very into, uh, what do I have? I got a bunch of Kirkland Himalayan salt chips. Uh, here, I was just at, at the Costco. Well, you're a big Costco guy. Did yeah. you get those this morning? I called Remo for our uh, for our uh, meeting this morning to talk about the show. He's like, yeah, I got some time. Just to Costco right yeah. now. Like, wow. You know, I don't talk about attacking the week, you know, with a, with a vengeance. 
Get up, daylight savings, who cares? Go to Costco at 9 in the morning. Well, I went yesterday, and the line was huge. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go uh, Monday morning. There's going to be no line. And I walked right in, uh, did my shopping, and left. So, yeah, I, I already have a bu- I already bought too many. Because, you know, I always go to the store. I'm like, yeah, I don't think I have those at home. And then you buy them. And then you come home, and you're like, oh, no. I did I did have these. That's happened to me a bunch. So, uh, I was set in that category. I'm, I'm trying to think of other, other big chips that I'm into. But uh, I think Lay's salt and vinegar are very good, but I could also be talked into old Dutch salt and vinegar. Uh, those now Lay's, I, I love the, I love the old, I mean, just the actual chip. It, it doesn't matter what the flavor is. I'll take old Dutch over Lay's every day. And I mean, Lay's I think is part of the Pepsi family. And I think as everyone knows or watches show, I'm pretty much always, you know, sipping on a diet Pepsi. So I have no, this is not it. This is no corporate bias. This is just straight up the facts that the old Dutch are the best. Um, I don't mind Sun Chips as well, the French onion, uh, a great, great product. Um, and the one thing that, and I'm not sure whether Lay's still makes this because I guess Hostess was the original company. I think they got uh, they got bought. The one thing that I would always get, and this takes me back to, you know, house league hockey at River Heights Arena, um, the hickory sticks, if you recall, one of the most unique products in the potato chip genre or category but the hickory stick um often imitated never duplicated yeah hickory stick they would always be in the rotation are i was thinking when i was putting together my list like are cheetos a chip does that does that count because i like uh i like a good cheetos uh puff uh, i'm not sure the hawkins cheesies i think are the goat of those the hawkins yeah. cheesies you know the the bag they've got the orange um cellophane yeah. around them I think I like I like Cheetos, although they do it does uh, get over your fingers, and so you got to be careful uh, when you're having them. But Stephen Stephen Hagashi in the chat room, I thought Old Dutch was Dutch oven, two very different experiences. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple a couple good comments. People loving the cheesies. There was a shout out to Hickory Six. We did mention Doritos. Uh, Doritos have a, a couple good good chips as well, but I think. Uh, we're from Winnipeg. We got to support uh, support the old Dutch uh, here. Yeah, well, old Dutch, and this is not. I mean, this is hashtag not spawn. Um, but if they wanted to hashtag spawn, we were here, and we would love to have old Dutch on uh, old Dutch on board. So yeah, you can hit us in the chat with your favorite chip style um, item as well, flavor brand. We'll get to a few of those more now. Remo, one other thing that we have to get to, um, a little bit of an entertainment update. Um, Romance update, if you will. Mm-hmm. Hard to believe that this has happened, but um, A Rod and J Lo have uh, have apparently broken up. Apparently, going their separate ways. Your thoughts? Yeah, I was uh, shocked to hear that. It was uh, maybe the most shocking celebrity breakup since uh, Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. I remember where I was uh, <laughs> when I got that text. A Rod and J Lo, their love seemed so true, so real. Um, I loved seeing them most recently at the inauguration together, hobnobbing with everyone. Uh, I think it's really yeah, sad. They I mean, if they breaking can't... up before the inauguration, that's for no. sure. That was some major camera time for uh, for both yeah. of them to get out. Now, it... listen, it's it was shocking to many people. Uh, not though, if you're a follower of former Mister Forty Forty himself. And Owen won in Rough and Rowdy, Jose Canseco. Why, you ask? Because on January 12th, Jose Canseco tweeted this. Alex Rodriguez and Jennifer Lopez will go their separate ways this year. And Alex Rodriguez will hook up with a fitness model. Now, does Jose Canseco have a have a crystal ball? Does he know something that we don't? Well, all that we know is that he quote tweeted that uh, on the weekend with Alex Rodriguez is the most predictable person on this planet. Well, J-Lo and A-Rod broke up. Well, I wonder who told you so. The truth hurts. And then here he goes. He's calling a shot again, Remus. Next girl you see A-Rod with will be a 25 to 30-year-old hot fitness model. The truth hurts. Um, (laughs) Jose could very well be right on all of this, by the way. I remember buying the book uh, Juiced when it came out. And uh, (laughs) everyone kind of mocked him. Everyone laughed at him. But it seemed like... Some of the stuff in there was true. Maybe I think some of it was verified just based on box scores. That was not possible. But he was right about a lot of stuff. So I don't know, maybe, I mean, if he quote tweeted himself, it's definitely, definitely real. So I mean, good for him, I guess. But he's always trying to stay 
well, stay in the spotlight, but uh, I follow him. I'm I'm here for uh, some Jose takes. He followed it up by sh- shooting numerous shots at J Lo. Uh, hey Jennifer Lopez, by the way, I am single and I can be faithful. J Lo, need a man that will be by your side 24 seven, who is older than you are, and it's br- and is broke. I fit that category perfectly. I'm your man. <laughs> And then, uh, and then he also threw this out. I guarantee you that A Rod will be trying to get a hold of my ex-wife Jessica very soon if he hasn't done it by now. Um, follow that up with, by the way, I am not a witch. I am a warlock. Oh, and did say to J Lo he would fight for I would fight for you, but I have two torn shoulders and a bad knee from his last fight. Still making up excuses for uh, losing in 30 seconds to barstool intern Billy Football in the last. Rough and rowdy. Yeah, that was a rough show. That was a tough look for Jose. That was a real. That was a real uh, tough look for Jose. But he's been on a vendetta against A Rod for a long time, and uh, just another opportunity for him to uh, pour salt uh, on the wound there. Well, and uh, one other thing, Jose. And again, you could just follow him at Jose Canseco. He also says that he can tell you the value of Bitcoin in three years, although did not divulge the value of Bitcoin in three years. So I guess we'll know. It sounds like Jose's probably got a great grasp of, of cryptocurrencies. I'm sure he, he should probably end up on, uh, you know, one of these, uh, you know, Fox Business News or something like that along with, uh, heck, if, if, if John Bradshaw Layfield from the WWE can be one of the top fitness uh, or um, financial analysis on TV, I don't know why Jose Canseco couldn't do a major career change. Exactly. And, we are here uh, discussing the Jets game tonight, and if you want to go with a uh, birthday narrative, uh, it is Mark Shifley's birthday. Yes. So uh, shout out to Joe from Winnipeg pointing that out in chat. He says Shifley's getting a hattie for his birthday, so you could take him to score on Cool Bet if you wanted to, or take him in your uh, fantasy lineups. But uh, I'm kind of curious if that's going to play. So shout out to Mark Shifley, a uh, big happy birthday. And we did also didn't mention before we leave, Drew Brees announced his retirement uh, over the weekend. Uh, congratulations to him. Incredible career. Maybe could have had uh, some more hardware in terms of a uh, championship, but they get they did get the one Super Bowl. And uh, I do remember when he was on San Diego, it didn't go well for him to start his career. He was becoming a free agent, had that horrible injury in the last game of the season. And, I mean, he had, could have signed with Miami, ended up signing with New Orleans, and the rest is history. Uh, one of the greatest of all time. So shout out to Drew Brees uh, for his retirement. Seems well with the- Go ahead. It seems like going to the broadcast booth now. Yeah, oh, listen, Breeze will have a very a, a great future going forward. It was really cute. He had his four little kids uh, announce his retirement on Instagram yesterday, a pretty cool 2021 way of doing things. And listen, yeah, I mean, the Saints, if you look back, you know, whether it's the Minnesota Miracle or the P.I. with the Rams, I mean, the, the, the playoff heartbreak that they went through um, was right up there with any team. But the fact of the matter is they won the Super Bowl. They did it in the aftermath of Katrina and Drew Brees will forever be a New Orleans sporting legend in a, a you know a town. I mean, that team was a joke essentially for its entire existence before Brees got there. And um, you know, he and Sean Payton won the thing. They probably maybe should have had another one or two. Um, but he'll always be a Super Bowl champion, and he'll always be the man in New Orleans. Actually, speaking of just a couple other quick NFL notes, Shaq Barrett back with the. Uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And you're seeing some of the top pass rushers right now um, really being the focus of NFL teams getting signed before free agency begins. He gets a $72 million deal with 36 guaranteed for four years. And this is interesting. Cam Newton re-signed last week, another year at 14 mil for the New England Patriots. Sounds like they're going to try to get him a few weapons. Remo, a, a guy we picked for cheap on fantasy often last year, former Titans tight end Jonu Smith gets a four-year, $50 million deal with $31 million guaranteed. So it seems like the Patriots are trying, finally spending a little bit of money and trying to give that offense a little bit more juice um, because it was uh, rudderless at times. Cam wasn't throwing the ball very much, and when he did, didn't have a lot of guys to catch it. Yeah, Cam got off to the, the hot start, but he was running the ball like so much. It wasn't sustainable. He got sick, had, had COVID, and really... That second half of the year was rough. So I was surprised to see that he did resign in New England because I thought by the end it was clear that it wasn't working. But they're going to try to make it work, try to get him some weapons. And uh, I, I'm, I don't think Cam is done, but uh, that second half, uh, I mean, it didn't look good. So uh, we'll see. Was it him? Was it the weapons? Uh, John o. Smith was a nice player. 
Uh, we'll see if he can you know, step up his game with the Patriots. They're looking for that tight end to replace uh, Gronkowski, who was so good uh, in the Super Bowl for uh, the Bucks. You got it. All right, well, listen, this has been a great show, Remo. Uh, thanks to everyone that's been with us. Big thanks to Dave McCarthy. We have to thank the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and especially Trevor Knott and Knott Auto Corp for that front page banner and the free press supporting Winnipeg Sports Talk today. It was amazing. And um, on behalf of Remus, thank you. 3,000 subs in a week. We uh, we can't believe the support. We want to keep it growing. We will work on that merch. We'll see if we can get something going in the next couple of weeks for that. But in the meantime, everybody, enjoy this game tonight. Jets and Montreal Canadiens will break it all down tomorrow with Scott Billick. And um, just starting off, Remo, another great week on Winnipeg Sports Talk and a huge week for the Winnipeg Jets with four big games to talk about here on WST Daily. Yeah, four big games at home. Not that uh, it really matters, I guess, home or away, but I am looking forward to these, uh, seeing what they can do. Can they get revenge against Montreal? Can they beat Montreal in regulation, Hus? Because it seemed like they're all uh, going overtime, but another big week. Uh, for the Jets. They're all big, and we are getting closer and closer to that trade deadline. The trade discussion uh, will be definitely heating up. Uh, you got it. All right, folks. And uh, Mitch <laughs> Mitch from Winnipeg Hockey Talk with the last word on J-Lo and A-Rod. She found out A-Rod was corking his bat. His bat. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to finish it off, guys. Thanks for all the comments. Thanks for the likes. Thanks to everyone listening on the podcast feed. Spread the word about Winnipeg Sports Talk and Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. All our links at all of our social media feeds at Sports Talk Winnipeg. And uh, if you're on Instagram, toss us a follow. we got to build that one up, too. Uh, for Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. we got to get these podcasts up for everyone driving home from work. Enjoy the game tonight. We'll see you tomorrow live on YouTube at 1 o'clock p.m. here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Have a great night, everybody.